Hi and welcome to Programming Percy and today we will be talking about Go 1.18 which is a major release to Golang and it comes with a bunch of amazing changes and the one most famous is probably generics which has been added but there's also a bunch of other great features that has been added which is often missed because everybody is focused on generics so in this video we will cover uh, what generics are and how they will be implemented in Go um, and we will also cover the other features such as fuzzing and workspaces and the other things added. If you want to dig deeper into the topics I have separate videos which goes into the topics in a much deeper level. We will only cover them briefly here to kind of just update our understanding of what's changing in the language. So, the most discussed thing is generics, and we are finally getting them. But it's kind of funny, because it seems to be a topic that can either upset developers, or they get praised. So, some developers really hate it, some developers seem to really love it. And I kind of love it myself. I think it will add a bunch of amazing utilities to the language. And if you're unfamiliar with generics, um, a generic is basically a way to allow multiple data types to be inserted into a function or into a structure. And we'll cover this more in detail very soon. Uh, in Go we have handled the lack of generics using a empty interface, which works but it's messy. Uh, I have seen many functions out there which accepts an interface as an input and then you typecast that into the wanted format or you use a type switch to determine what input it is. So if you have a function that accepts either a integer or a float or a int 32 you would do this big type switch which checks is it this one is it this one and it's I don't like it it's unmaintainable and also hard to read when a new developer comes and finally gone are the days where we have to use the interface hack uh, so to start looking at generics uh, I'm going to show you a example where we have a the mission is to calculate the total value of a integer slice and a float slice and we will begin by looking at how we did this pre generics so I will create a main file I will also create a new module which will be programming .tech slash generics and we will create our main package and we will begin by the first function which accepts a slice of int 64s and calculates the total value uh, in the slice so count total int 64 and we will accept a slice of int 64s and output the int 64 value because we want the output value to be the same data type and we will have the total we will range over the values and we will add the value to the total and once we have done that for everyone we will return the total value now this is how it would look before generics and now let's say we again have to do this for floats you would basically copy paste this and redo it but instead it would be done on floats and this I mean it works but it's messy and as you can understand, the more data types we want to support, it becomes nasty. And people solve this using the type switch I mentioned earlier to avoid having these duplicate functions, or they used the duplicate function method. 
and it's not it's not really nice. So let's give this a try also to just see that it works. So we have a slice of in64 values which will be created here. And let's just add some default values to it. We will have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, uh, eight, nine. I have to think about the numbers. It's sad. And then also let's do the same for the float. So we will have float 64 values. And the data type will be float 64. And we will kind of append dot o to everyone to make sure that this is a float. So amazing. And we can print this. Uh, let's just do total for int 64. And we will do count total integers, which will be the int64 slice. And we will again total for float 64. And we will pass in the count total float. And let's run this. Go run main. And we should see the sum all reaches 55, which is great. It's supposed to. Now, we wouldn't want to add more data types because that's a lot of code and a lot of work. But let's look at generics, because this can solve this for us really easy. We can actually make one function now, which does the same thing for our wanted data types. So let's go ahead and make a new function, which is count total. We don't need to specify the data type because this will accept a bunch of data types. And what you do is you create these brackets, which is the type parameter. So normally you do the squares and you put pa pass in the input parameter and the data type. But with generics, you do the square brackets and you input the alias for the value. So our, our, our generic data type will be v, short for value, and we can pass in the accepted data types. So in 64 or a integer or a float32 or a float64. What we do his, here is that we say any of these data types are accepted and we will reference them using capital V. And in here we also need to say that the input to the function is going to be a slice of capital V. So again points slice of capital V and we will output capital V which can be again any of the allowed input data types. And we can actually copy paste this and say that total is a type of v and we will range through it and return the total and now we can actually remove these functions here because we can call the generic function instead which is count total and you could do it this way just this is allowed it will actually infer the data type to use but you can also specify it, adding the square brackets again and forcing it to use a data type. So in this case, let's be nice to the compiler and say this is a int64 data type and this is a float64 data type. Now when we do this, it will make sure that the input is of the correct data type and the output is also a v as you see here so the output we get back will be a in 64 now as you can see my piler says the compiler says that this is an unnecessary type argument which is what i said we we can infer this so we could remove it but we can also add it let's do both this is just good to know because sometimes you will need to so again 
we can remove the old functions and we can run this and it will print and this is amazing because you can imagine how much code you can remove and uh, this is great. Another big feature being added to Go is fuzzing and it's a way of generating input to your unit tests and I'm surprised more people haven't been talking about this on the forums. Uh, it will give us the ability to automatically generate input to your unit tests to see where they break, where they would break. And it might it might not sound like much. Many people have already solved some of this using table-driven tests to easily set up new test cases, but you won't write a few hundred unit tests to try different inputs but fuzzing can make this super easy and it will allow us to generate thousands of different inputs and just pass it into your param uh, function until it crashes and this is the idea behind fuzzing you kind of just keep generating stuff until it breaks and it will tell you that okay but when I did this broke and that's amazing to find find edge cases and this is also very great because you can use something called a seed corpus and the seed corpus is kind of this starting point where you will start the generating generated data so it won't just do random data it will actually keep a structure that you have defined and the fuzzing will be added to the standard testing uh, library, but to use it you will use testing.f instead of testing.t. And we can actually do a quick test here. And we can do package main, we will write a function. And just as your unit test we, which begins with test, we will begin our fuzzers with Fuzz, you can see my IDE even recommends this. But let's not name it XXX, uh, let's name it instead parse query. This example is actually from the official documentation, so I haven't made this example up. Uh, but if you want to see more advanced use cases of fuzzing, I recommend my follow up video in where we look at how to fuzz input for HTTP handlers and stuff, which is just amazing. But what you do is you have your uh, testing uh, F here, and test F can add the seed corpus by using the add flag. So in this use case, we will test how the URL package handles the query string in the get param. So we can actually add a use case, which will be a get values and y equals 2. So this is the starting point for the seed corpus. And it will just keep generating data that looks like this as a starting point and just add things to it until your function breaks. And what you do is you call f.fuzz, which accepts a uh, signature which is the function and the testing flag the regular test flag and a string the, a, the string input is the fast data so you will actually find the generated data in the a string so once we have this we need to add the boom and we can now call our function that we want to fast inside of here so we will parse query the a string because the a string is the generated data now in this case we use a single value because we added a single value to the seed corpus which was a string but if your fuzzer would need a integer you can add multiple values to the seed corpus and it will actually generate both aligned so it would generate a string and a integer and then you would need to accept that down here be the integer 
but in our case we are simply testing the URL parser. And again, now this thing about fuzzers is you would need to skip sometimes because some things you know will crash, like if it's not a valid string. And we will talk more about that in the follow-up video. So we can query encode the string and we can do query2 and we can parse it again parse query and we will do query string2 and now we can check if this should work for example and here we will do fail blah 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 this does not work and error now this would keep generating query strings just thousands of them and it will run forever until crashes and finding a bug in your code and make sure you read my article about fuzzing and or check the video because you can do a lot with this this is just a simple example how you would like check that the parsing and encoding worked and generated the same output over and over which it should if you encode something and then decode it it should be the same another great thing that has been added to the language is workspaces and workspaces is a new way to allow developers to easily work on multiple modules at the same time if you have been working in a company environment you're probably familiar with this problem and like I'm, me myself, I find myself working on multiple modules all the time and I make changes in them the same time. Because I want to test a, how a, let's say a microservice uh, does something and it outputs to another microservice which does another thing. And I have a bug which correlates to the two at the same time and I want to test that. So I kind of want to modify them at the same time. But this can be hard in Go and what you usually see is people inside the Go mod would use the replace directive and what you would do basically let's say we have a require here which requires a certain Go package uh, which would be let's make this simple so github programming percy and my module this is made up and it would expect version 1 now I might be working on the version on my computer but the released version on github would differ but I want to use my local version you would do replace to kind of tell it that any import to this module which would be program person my module should instead be fetched from a certain path on my local machine so whenever the go get or the go module would see this path uh, so let's see my module so whenever my program would see this being imported it would instead go to my local folder and get the code from that location and that would allow me to work on the same module or a different module on another module but as you might understand we're inside the go mod and we're modifying a generated file and that's not good and many of you have probably seen the replace directive being pushed into the repository which you don't want because when another developer comes and downloads this go mod file if my replace is still there it won't work because he won't have this location probably and this is a problem and it's been a problem for a while so the go team has created go workspaces which allows you to create a go.work file <clears throat> and inside the go work file you can instead store your uh, replace directives and 
you would need to also do go work in it to start actually okay I re already created a file but uh, to, to start using go workspaces you need to initialize it and you would do that doing go work in it and it would create the go work for you and then you can place your replace directives in the go work instead and you can git ignore the go work because the go work shouldn't matter to the other developers uh, and this will keep us from not having to modify the go mod file and this is common practices in most generated files we should never really modify generated files so it's great that we have seen a solution for this problem so finally there are also some honorable mentions now my honorable mentions aren't big enough to get their own video but they're important enough to start mentioning and the first one I'd like to show is the any alias and if you start seeing the keyword any in your project don't freak out because any is an alias for the empty interface as you can see in my ID here it's equivalent to the interface but it looks a lot better than interface uh, with the brackets so if you see any that's the same thing as an interface so remember that and you will probably see this when you see generic functions because they will many times accept the any instead of a interface <coughs> which is the same but and another keyword being added is a another alias which is comparable compare comparable hard word to say for me comparable and the comparable is all the data types that you can compare using uh, equals equals so if we hover over it we can see that booleans numbers strings pointers channels arrays can all be compared so this is great because instead of doing what we did below here where we used float int in 64 we can even make this easier and say comparable so that's amazing actually we can't because it's comparable but you get the idea and another thing which I have used a lot which I find amazing is a new feature called in a package for handling IP addresses handling IP addresses has been tedious in Golang we we had the net IP but it didn't really work well and to handle this now they have made a new package called net slash slash net ap ip so that's net slash net ip and this function will add new ways for handling ip addresses which i do a lot and i find this solution a lot better check it out if you're doing a lot of ip addresses it's worth it now we also have one which I like a lot and it's a new string feature and it's actually strings.cut so if we go ahead and okay what's going on in my ID oh sorry uh, it's strings.cut and this uh, is the function I never knew I needed but once I saw it I, it kind of like wow I need this and what it does is it allows us to take a separator pass in a string and return anything found before the separator and after so that's amazing basically if <laughs> again internet IPs so you usually it's not uncommon to see like some IP colon a port and strings.cut can easily allow us to kind of 
say that we want the separator to be used which is a feature I never knew I needed and didn't even realize it was missing but this is amazing so this kind of concludes the brief overview of all the updates that are being introduced in Go and the Go team has been working hard I, we can tell there's a lot of great features now I'm particularly fond of the fuzzing and I feel the fuzzing has this great potential also of course the generics but make sure you check out my in-depth videos of how generics work and how you can use them to your advantage and also the fuzzing the fuzzing is amazing so if you haven't already update to go 1.18 uh, right when I make this video even go 18.1 is released and also, if you like my videos, make sure to like and subscribe, and I will see you around.